Okay, so Adrian Bailey is going to talk to you. Adrian is a uh, principal in our uh, Sydney office, uh, has a Master of Taxation and is uh, very knowledgeable, particularly in this area. Uh, this is a paper he's given uh, at a number of conferences, including uh, Television Education Network in the last couple of months, uh, and it's a very good paper, so uh, I hope you enjoy it. I'll hand over to Adrian. Thanks, Paul. Um, just, I guess, in terms of initial that question uh, before about not being able to hear, if it's still not working, you look at the, look at the top right-hand side of your screen, there's a little cog button that'll tell you what speakers you're listening on and sometimes... Uh, it's diverted to a, a speaker that's not working. So with that, um, we're going to kick off the presentation today. Um, the agenda for the morning is that we're going to talk about taxation of testamentary trusts and how they are taxed. Have a look at the May 2018 budget changes, which uh, as of this week are now law. Uh, have a look at some issues with shares when they're passing to testamentary trusts and some of the things that we may need to think about, predominantly dealing with private uh, company shares superannuation and how that interacts with testamentary trusts, uh, issues with land. Uh, so there's a variety of uh, land tax issues as well as stamp duty uh, and other taxes that we'll need to think about. Uh, in terms of the small business concessions, considering whether we can still apply the small business concessions and testamentary trusts when the assets are held by them. And rounding off with having a look at some of the foreign uh, trustee or foreign beneficiary traps that we come across in practice. Uh, obviously, with the world these days, uh, more common uh, for there to be foreign trustees or foreign beneficiaries and having a look at how that it can impact on our estate planning when we're having a look at tax issues in relation to that. I should say, to, to start off with, uh, although we're talking about tax for the, the entire presentation, I mean, in reality, the main reason for the use of testamentary trust is protection of the assets. Uh, so the idea being that we're drafting a testamentary trust so that we're protecting the estate for the benefit of the generation and the generation after. There are some tax advantages that come uh, with testamentary trusts as well as some of the tax issues which we'll run through. Uh, but uh, the idea is that, um, or the, the main thing is that with nearly all clients I deal with, when we're generally not focusing on tax. We obviously need to be aware of that when we're considering what comprises the estate. Uh, however, the main purpose of these using testamentary trust is that asset protection, as I mentioned before. So to jump into taxation of testamentary trusts and how they're actually taxed, um, Division 6AA of the Income Tax Assessment Act 1936 is what you kind of consider to be called an anti-avoidance or a punitive provision, in that if we have somebody who is a prescribed person and they receive uh, income uh, from a discretionary trust, uh, then they can be subject to tax at punitive rates. So one of the definitions of prescribed persons is a minor. Uh, so if we have passive income derived by a minor or a trust distribution, uh, then the tax rates are shown on the slide here. So if between zero and $416, it's nil. Uh, above that, up to 1,307, it's 66%. Uh, and above that uh, is 45%. So in effect, what you have is any amount uh, above $416 is taxed at, in, in essence, the top marginal tax rate. Obviously, the reasoning behind this in terms of a policy, uh, government policy, is that for situations where we have family trusts that are established now and operating businesses, if we have large families or even not so large families, this precludes uh, the trust from distributing income to minors who are, of course, uh, not earning income elsewhere generally, uh, without there being uh, the punitive tax rate applied uh, to stop that sort of income spreading. Of course, it doesn't stop you distributing income to miners. You can still do that. Uh, and uh, you can do it accepting that you're going to be paying tax above $416 at, a, in effect, the, the top marginal rate. So what we sometimes come across with uh, clients with uh, family trusts is the practice of distributing up to $416 to minors with the idea being that they can receive that and be tax free. I recognize and I know most of the people on the call are accountants and uh, we need to save money where we can for our clients in particular tax money. But I often ponder whether that's really a, a smart approach when we think about it in the long run. Okay, we're saving you know, $200 in tax now, uh, but if we have a later amendment uh, in terms of an amended assessment to our trust income, uh, 
we know what Bamford says is that uh, any increased tax or any increased income, I should say, will flow in proportion to our original distributions. So if we have a miner receiving $416 and we have an amended assessment at a later time, then that miner will be receiving more than $416 under the Bamford uh, court decision. So in order to save a few bucks, we may end up in a position where sometime down the track, we're paying substantially more tax than we may have. Uh, so just something to consider there uh, if you're in the practice of distributing uh, that $416 to miners. So in terms of testamentary trusts and the way that they are taxed differently, income from a testamentary trust, and I'll go into what uh, the rules are in terms of how we qualify, is what's called accepted trust income. And that carves us out of the punitive rates of Division 6 AA. Uh, and so accept, accepted trust income is defined in Section 102 AG 2A uh, as one of the definitions. It's not just the only accepted trust income, but because we're talking about testamentary trust today, uh, we're going to focus on accepted trust income from a, uh, a will. So what it says is that we need two requirements. There's distributions to a minor from the trust, so somebody under the age of 18, and it's income from a trust that is established under a will or codicil or, or an order of a court that varies or modifies the provisions of a will or codicil. So those are our two requirements, income distributed to minor, income is income from a trust established under a will. That's not the end of 102 AG, and there are some further sub clauses, in particular 102 AG3 and 102 AG4, which I'll come back to, which can impact on whether we have accepted trust income or not. Uh, but for the, and we will cover those in later slides in the paper and have a discussion on them. But I guess uh, one of the things is that um, uh, for lawyers, uh, we don't just stop reading the provision once we get to sub clause two, we've got to read on further. Uh, but in the normal scheme of things, accepted trust income to a minor income derived uh, from a trust established under a will. In terms of the practical effect of 102 AG, it's we now have the situation if we qualify that any distributions we make to minors from a testamentary trust are taxed at an adult rate. Uh, so in effect, uh, we can have up to $18,200 tax free uh, for each minor beneficiary of the testamentary trust. Now this is, of course is a very handy tax saving, uh, but it's not the be all and end all. Uh, and as I say to clients, three things need to uh, happen in order for this saving to be achieved. First off, somebody has to die. Uh, quite often it's difficult to find volunteers to do that. Uh, there has to be income generated by the testamentary trust, which will depend on the makeup of the assets of the estate and what's passing under the testamentary trust, particularly now that we've had the amendments that were announced in the May 2018 budget. Uh, and there have to be minor beneficiaries to receive it. So in many client circumstances, when you actually talk to them about it, uh, there is going to be no tax savings from a testamentary trust uh, if they were to pass away that day, for example. Of course, we could, we still need to consider the future in relation to that. And uh, so, so take the example for a 50 year old client we're dealing with, dealing with. If they've got children, it's likely those children are adults. They may not have started their own families yet. So although that may change in the future, when we're talking to a client now, there is really no tax benefit from a testamentary trust. Of course, there may be in the future, but it, it does come back to my earlier statements in relation to we don't really establish testamentary trust for the tax benefits. There are tax benefits in certain circumstances, but the main reason is that protection. Whenever you have a tax benefit, you're going to have people pushing the boundaries. Uh, and uh, in this case, the most uh, relevant case on Section 102 AG, and, and still relevant, even though it's now 30 years old, uh, is the estate of the late AW First Number 5 Will Trust and the Federal Commissioner of Taxation. Um, in terms of the facts of this decision, uh, what happened was that uh, there was a testamentary trust established, so the AW First Number 5 Will Trust, which was established in 1974 on the death of Anthony Wilfred First by his will. The initial amount devolved to the trust under the estate was $1. Uh, in essence, what has happened is, is that some enterprising lawyers, and often as enterprising, enterprising lawyers and accountants, uh, have had Mr. W Mr. First execute a will establishing a number of will trusts, all of which received a dollar. Uh, and one of those lawyers has taken control of the number five will trust. He then borrowed uh, a sum of money 
and acquired the units in his uh, practice trust, uh, his law practice trust. So subsequently, income was derived from the practice cr trust that was distributed to the unit holder being the AW First Number no. 5 Will Trust, which was then distributed to minor beneficiaries. Unsurprisingly, the commissioner did not like this outcome uh, and took the view that it was not accepted trust income uh, and made the argument uh, that it didn't apply as the asset was what was not one that derived under the estate. So it didn't pass to the trust under the estate, remembering that trust only received $1. However, the, uh, the court disagreed and Justice Hill uh, made a statement which I'll, I'll refer to, which said that with respect, I do not accept the commissioner's submission. It requires the words in 102 AG 2A, which are that resulted from refer to the assessable income rather than the words in some para 1 to a will. Uh, in my opinion, all that is necessary to fall within section 102 AG 2A is that the assessable income is income of the trust estate and that trust estate being one of the forms of a trust estate referred to. So one created under the will uh, or a codicil or a, or a court order. So what the judge was saying was it doesn't matter in this circumstance uh, that the assets have gone in after the, after the will and were not subjected under the will to the testamentary trust, but it's enough that the income was income from a trust estate that was established under the will. So the taxpayer had a win in that matter. He went on, Justice Hill went further and went on to say that, uh, that, that he didn't agree obviously with the commissioner's contention uh, and stated that clearly the legislator, so the, the government must have contemplated the case where the will assets were sold and the proceeds reinvested. Uh, so what happened in the present case is that the trustee borrowed funds and used the borrowed funds to invest in such a way as to derive assessable income from the investment. Uh, so that still was assessable income of the trust estate uh, and clearly that was one that had derived under the will. So as I said, a win for the taxpayer there. There were some amendments to Section 102 AG, which came about after first, so back in the 90s. Um, and they were the introduction of uh, Sections 102 AG 3 and 102 AG 4 in their current form as of the beginning of the week. They have changed slightly again since then, since the, uh, the May 2018 budgets passed the House or the Senate this week. Um, though it, sh it should be, uh, uh, it's worth pointing out that those uh, clauses were already in 102 AG. Uh, and what happened in terms of those amendments was that they were separated out from sub clause two and separate sub clauses three and four. Uh, so it was in, in effect a renumbering uh, of the clause. So section 102 AG three limits accepted trust income to no more than amounts would that be derived at an arm's length transaction. So, uh, and both sub three and sub four are what you would consider to be uh, anti-avoidance provisions. So sub three, the sort of scenario where you would be dealing with there is say, for example, uh, the trust held a uh, commercial property uh, and it decided to rent it out to a related party and the rent that it charged was above market value so that you had more income in the testamentary trust and you could then distribute that to minors. That would be something that would be caught by section 102 AG3. So things that are above arm's length value. The other uh, section 102 AG4, and, uh, sorry, I should say in considering whether 102 AG3 applies for our clients, it's not in relation to whether the asset that went into the trust was done at arm's length. Uh, it was, uh, was the income derived at arm's length. So in the scenario where in first, where we had them borrow to acquire the units in the practice trust, that's obviously still acting at arm's length, but that's not relevant for the purpose of 102 AG3. Where it may be relevant is 102 AG4, which talks about where there's been an agreement to ensure that the income constituted accept, is accepted trust income. So in that kind of scenario uh, where we have, uh, for example, coming back to first with the transfer of the practice units, if that was done at no value or they didn't borrow to acquire those units, then I would make an argument that 102 AG4 applies. Uh, because we have an agreement there to ensure that the income constitutes accepted trust income. Of course, there's difficulties with the commissioner applying 102 AG4 uh, in that, for example, a transfer to, of an asset to a testamentary trust is not an agreement if it's done by something like declaration of trust. And 
the and the purpose of it is really to to generate future sorry to benefit future generations rather than to ensure there is accepted trust income but that being said it is there so it's something that we need to be aware of which brings us to the may 2018 budget announcement so in the may 2018 budget the federal government announced that they were amending section 102 ag to ensure that it would only apply to income derived from assets passing under the will from 1 july 2019 like with most budget announcements these days, it was fairly light on detail. And it wasn't until the release of draft legislation, which has now been passed through both houses as of the 16th of June, uh, so this week, uh, that uh, we were aware of what the changes were really going to be. So those changes were contained in Treasury Laws Amendment 2009 Measures Number 3 Bill. Um, and it is in effect from 1 July 2019. So first of all, one thing to remember that if we have a testamentary trust where the assets passed before 1 July 2019, these amendments do not impact on it. So it's status quo for those testamentary trusts. So the amendments that have come through limit accepted trust income to the following scenarios. So that, that must be income that must be derived from property that has passed under the will um, and or property that has been an accumulation on that property uh, of income or capital that has passed under the will or has been substituted uh, or, uh, or oh, sorry, I should say that's it. So the three things, property transferred to the testamentary trust, property represent or the property, property represents an accumulation of income or capital from that property. So that, that would allow us to change assets or accumulations of income or property from the substituted assets. So, Going back to first, uh, in terms of that, uh, it, that would be struck out by these amendments. The asset passing uh, to, under the will was only one dollar, uh, so we couldn't have the situation where we could then borrow and acquire a, an asset and have that to be accepted trust income. Of course, we may still want to do that for other reasons in terms of asset protection, uh, but we're not going to have any tax benefits as there were in first. It doesn't change us substituting assets or changing assets or accumulating income, all of that will still get concessional tax treatment. So coming back to one of my earlier statements about having a look at actually what comprises the estate, if there is not much that's going to pass down via the estate to the testamentary trust under the will, then uh, we are not really going to have any tax advantages there from the testamentary trust. I, I do wonder though whether the changes were strictly necessary because I would have thought that in terms of the anti-avoidance provisions in sub three and sub four of 102 AG, uh, we could still capture, or the commissioner, if they wanted to, would could still capture strategies like first. And if you have a look at one of the examples in the explanatory memorandum, which I'll read, it says, on 1 July, 2019, testamentary trust ABC is established under a will of which a minor is a beneficiary. Pursuant to the will, 100,000 is transferred to the trustee from the estate of the deceased. Shortly after, a related family trust makes a capital distribution of 1 million to the testamentary trust. The resulting 1.1 million is invested in ASX listed shares. Dividend income of 110,000 is derived for the 1920 year. The net income of the trust is 110,000 and the minor is presently entitled to 50% of the net income. The explanatory memorandum goes on to say that the accepted trust income component will only relate to the income derived from the initial $100,000. So, that's clear enough under the, the amended legislation, but I would have thought that would already been caught under section 102 AG4, uh, because we have a distribution of capital from the other trust to the original trust from which they've acquired assets. Uh, and you could make an argument to say that that was done in, so that in order that we could derive accepted trust income. There are two other scenarios which I can think of that will be caught by the new provisions. One of, of course, is first, which is I've already mentioned, where you receive a nominal amount and borrow to acquire a large income producing asset, or where income of a, another trust is funneled through a testamentary trust on the basis that it is then therefore technically income of a trust estate. So we have a, a business trust, for example, that distributes income from the business to the testamentary trust under strict interpretation of the law that is income of the testamentary trust when it distributes. However, that would be struck out by these changes that have come through this week. So that's taxation of testamentary trusts. The other thing that we're going to have a look at uh, in terms of testamentary trusts uh, is issues with shares. Uh, having a look at issues in terms of franking credits, 
So whether that's uh, shares that are um, uh, ASX type shares or whether that's private shares, having a look at the continuity of ownership tests. So when we're having a look at uh, distribute, uh, making a, a gift of private company shares under a will to a testamentary trust. And then also considering on a later disposal, will the testamentary trust have access to CGT concessions, including the discount capital gain? So dealing with the first issue in terms of franking credits, it would be very unusual uh, for a testamentary trust to meet the definition of a fixed trust uh, under the franking credit rules. So what this means, and when I say very unusual, it would, it would in effect have to require that there is only one beneficiary and they receive all income uh, and capital of the testamentary trust. So really no point in having it. Um, so bearing that in mind, what this means in practice is that if we're receiving large di dividends from private companies, the trustee will need to consider whether to make a family trust election or if there's already one in the family group an interposed entity election to ensure the retention of those franking credits. The other issue which we should be aware of uh, are the trust streaming requirements, which came in in the 2010, 2011 year. And we have covered those in earlier presentations, but in order for our beneficiaries of our testamentary trust to receive the franking credits, they have to be specifically entitled to the income relating to the dividend. Now it's clear under the legislation, in order to be specifically entitled, the beneficiary must receive or reasonably be expected to receive the net financial benefit relating to the distribution, so the distribution of the dividend, and they must be recorded in its character as such in the accounts or records of the trust. What this means in practice is that our tr terms of our testamentary trust must have sufficient power for the trustee to separately record and categorize as well as deal with different types of income. The legislation is clear that if our trustee does not have that power, we cannot make a beneficiary specifically entitled. So it's not too uncommon to come across older testamentary trusts or uh, even these days, some what you'd consider to be a basic testamentary trust that do not have that power uh, and we don't have the ability to stream uh, different types of income or record different types of income. So we want to be careful if we have a testamentary trust uh, that's receiving large franc dividends that we have those powers so we can stream them and meet the requirements. Another thing to think about would be a, a, the continuity of ownership tests uh, in relation to losses. So our scenario in this is that we have an existing private company with losses. The shares pass to a testamentary trust under the death of the will maker. So we're assuming that we have a, an individual who holds more than 50% of the shares. Uh, so then if they pass away and our shares go to a testamentary trust, in order to continue to hold the losses, and no one really wants to give away losses if they don't have to, then either we need to meet the continuity of ownership test or the same business test. Section 162, sorry, Section 165, 205 of the Income Tax Assessment Act 1997 allows us to treat a beneficiary under a will uh, as, as if they still owned, sorry, as if the shares that they receive under the will are still owned by the deceased. So if we have, for example, in our scenario, the shares were going to Frank uh, in his own right, then Frank uh, can treat them as if they were still owned by the deceased and we still meet the continuity of ownership test. So we don't have issues in relation to the, the the dissolving of these losses in the company. However, section 165205 requires the beneficiary of the state to beneficially own those shares. A trustee of a trust does not beneficially own those shares. Uh, so we can't meet the test in 165205. So you may be thinking, well, okay, that's okay. We can still pass the same business test. And certainly if we're dealing with a private company that's operating a business and continues to do so, the test can be passed and the losses are maintained even if we, if we fail the continuity of ownership tests. Of course, an issue is going to be arise is where it's not a trading company. So what if we have an investment company that uh, invests in ASX shares, for example, or invests in private company shares? Or what if we have something like a bucket company or corporate beneficiary that's not actively carrying on a business? Um, what's our scenario there? And if it has losses, how do we ensure that we maintain those losses if we're using testamentary trusts? We can get a little bit of comfort from a private binding ruling that the commissioner issued 
uh, which is listed on the slide there in 105 140 Now, before we get into that, um, we need to be aware that private binding rulings are only uh, provide protection to the person that they are issued to, although they give an indication of the way the commissioner will approach something, it does not necessarily guarantee that he's going to apply the same uh, analysis and the same outcome to our clients. So just because there's a private binding ruling doesn't mean uh, that uh, we, can, we can go on willy nilly and assume that we're gonna pass the same business test. So in that private binding ruling, the commissioner came to the conclusion that due to the scale of the investment holdings and the business-like way that they were managed, the company was carrying on a business and would pass the same business test. I think I find that concession and that ruling by the commissioner extremely generous. I've certainly been in many audit meetings with the client and the ATO where we've been discussing whether a particular entity is carrying on a business uh, and they've always taken a very hard view on that. Uh, however, uh, in this circumstance, they decided that uh, because of the size of the investments, it was carrying on a business. Of course, may I, may I also get some further comfort from extrapolating taxation ruling 2019-1, where the commissioner considers the concept of carrying on a business for the purposes of the small business entity tax rate and states that there is a presumption that a company carries on a business because that is why they are formed. However, as mentioned before, every client's circumstances are different it's not unreasonable to think that the commissioner may reach different conclusions on different factual matrices. So if we have a, comp a private company with losses, we may need to reconsider whether those shares go to a testamentary trust or whether they go elsewhere, depending on the circumstances, so we don't lose those losses. Turning now to superannuation and dealing with superannuation and testamentary trusts. So First off, we just need to quickly revisit the rules in relation to superannuation death benefits, both from a SISAC perspective and a tax act perspective. So one thing to remember is that we need to consider the definition of dependence in the legislation. So by its nature, a superannuation fund is a trust established for the purpose of providing retirement benefits. Uh, and this is reinforced by rules within the SIS Act, uh, or sorry, the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act. And the term dependent is defined differently, whether we're in the SIS world or whether we're in the tax world. So for CIS purposes, a dependent is a spouse, a child, a person who is economically dependent on the member or a dependent within the ordinary common law meaning of that term. Under the for tax purposes, it's a spouse, a child under the age of 18, a person who is economically dependent of, or dependent within the ordinary common law meaning. So in other words, our definition of tax dependent for tax purposes, sorry, a definition of dependent for tax purposes is more narrow in practical terms because it doesn't include adult children. Although under the CIS Act, we can make a nomination to an adult ch child, they will not be a dependent for tax purposes and we may end up uh, with payments being taxable. Or we will end up with payments being taxable. So this issue drives many clients to consider realising their investments while they're alive and the fund is in pension mode. So there is mostly a cash member account at the date of death. In terms of the levels of taxation of super fund, just recapping on that, remembering that on, in the super fund, we're taxed on the realisation of investments, but we can also be taxed when a benefit is paid to a member or a beneficiary. What we would normally deal with in that scenario is superannuation death benefits in terms of lump sum payments. For a death benefits dependent, that tax payable is nil. However, for a non-dependent, there is a tax-free component and a tax element up to 17%. In terms of passing superannuation benefits to a testamentary trust, the first rule, as always, uh, is read the deed. Uh, but however, normally it is generally at the discretion of the trustee unless they have been, giving, been given a binding death benefit nomination. Having said that, there is only a small group of people that under the CIS legislation that we can distribute to. So aside from the ones that we've already mentioned and are listed on the slide, the other eligible recipient is the legal personal representative uh, of, of the deceased. Remembering that we do need to read the deed because not all deeds use the phrase legal personal representative. So if we're preparing our nominations, we want to make sure that we uh, are using the right ones, uh, right terms in preparing those nominations. So if we can distribute to the legal personal representative, uh, then in essence, the funds can flow to the testamentary trust from there because then they form part of the estate. 
in terms of making those nominations for retail funds, uh, general rules are that there are lapsing and there are witnessing requirements for all nominations, I should say. For a super fund, again, it depends on the deed and we can have non-lapsing nominations and most super fund deeds will have the ability to make a non-lapsing nomination. For retail funds, they still tend to lapse after three years. Uh, and we can be a little bit more flexible with superannuation funds. Uh, so we can write in other ways that nominations can be made. One of the issues with binding death benefit nominations and, and testamentary trust or estate planning generally uh, is that obviously we need to have an eligible recipient. So it can only go you know, a certain number of ways. Legal personal representative, spouse, uh, child, dependent. The advantage of having a binding death benefit nomination is that we have certainty. If we have done it correctly uh, and we've done it in accordance with the deed, then we are going to have the ability uh, to make sure that our nomination goes in a particular way. One of the disadvantages of that, therefore, is that it's inflexible. Uh, and it compromises asset protection for beneficiaries. So for that, I mean the example, if we make a nomination to go to my child, I pass away, the payment must be made to my child. And just before I pass away, my child becomes bankrupt uh, or my child is getting sued in relation to matters or is going through a family law issue. So we're not getting real asset protection there for beneficiaries. Um, one of the ways to deal with that is to deal with what's is to establish what's commonly known as a superannuation proceeds trust. So it is a form of a test, uh, of a testamentary trust, and if paid to the legal per personal representative, we can have our will establish a trust that the only beneficiaries are death benefit dependents. If we have death benefit dependents, in that way, our concessional tax treatment uh, will flow through, even though the funds are going to a testamentary trust in the form of a superannuation proceeds trust. However, we do need to remember that because we are limiting the number of beneficiaries, we're having a trade-off in terms of both flexibility and also asset protection as well. But it is a way of maintaining a concessional tax treatment while, while uh, putting funds into what is uh, not perfect, but is still a testamentary trust. Uh, of course, it's gonna depend on client circumstances. Um, the alternative, of course, is to pay it, accept the tax, pay it into the estate, and then send it to a fully discretionary uh, testamentary trust. A discussion to have with the client about the pros and cons of each approach, and will often depend obviously on the size of the superannuation as to which approach is taken and the personal circumstances. We're going to now turn to dealing with issues with land that ends up in testamentary trusts. So the three key points that we're going to deal with are the CGT main residence exemption and whether we can still maintain access to that, land tax issues uh, involving testamentary trusts uh, and foreign surcharges. So most, not all states, have introduced these concept of foreign surcharges for both duty as well as land tax, where we have what's called a foreign trust. So we'll need to bear in mind and consider whether our testamentary trust is going to fall afoul of those provisions where it holds land. Dealing with main residence first, um, section 118 and 100, 118-195 of the Income Tax Assessment Act 1997 provides the rules for determining whether the CGT main residence exemption applies on the sale of a residence from a deceased estate. Put simply, it requires that the main residence exemption can still be accessed where a beneficiary sells a dwelling they inherit within two years of the date of death if the dwelling was the deceased main residence at the date of death and it had not been used for producing accessible income. Section 118.195, however, only provides this benefit to individual beneficiaries or the trustee of the deceased estate, not trustees of a testamentary trust. So a main residence passing to a testamentary trust on a strict interpretation of that provi those provisions would not be able to access them, uh, even if we sold it within the two years and it wasn't, uh, wasn't used for income producing purposes. Of course, a solution to that would be to sell it prior to distributing it to the, or distributing it to the testamentary trust. So while we're administering the estate, we sell the main residence. Um, but it's also worthwhile noting that the ATO have an administrative practice of treating the phrase trustee of deceased estate 
as broad enough to include the trustees of a testamentary trust. And that's evidenced in ATO ID 2006-34 and 2004-882. It ought to be therefore possible to structure the testamentary trust to rely on these interpretive decisions by granting life interest to beneficiaries in the residence and the dwelling remaining the main residence of those beneficiaries. As usual, caution needs to be taken in this approach as ATO interpretive decisions are not binding on the commissioner and his view of course may change in the future. So as I said, in that case, it may be safer to sell it while uh, you're administering the estate and that way you can rely on the main residence exemption. If for whatever reason, the trustee decides to buy a property that will be used as a residence, so trustee of the testamentary trust I'm talking about here, it is important to remember that for CGT purposes, the concession, the main residence concession, concession is only available for individuals. Uh, there are ways that we, you could structure that so that you still maintain the main residence exemption in terms of uh, granting a life interest or uh, a long-term lease to a particular beneficiary. Uh, but just remembering in, at, the, at the first instance, if a testamentary trust is acquiring a main residence for somebody, uh, they are not going to get access to the main residence exemption unless we do something else. One of the other things to consider in terms of uh, taxes when, when assets are passing to testamentary trusts are land tax. Operating in New South Wales, we probably have the worst uh, in terms of the most punitive land tax uh, legislation in terms of property being held within discretionary trusts or testamentary trusts. But just to consider off some of the issues that we need to think about when dealing with clients, if we have a testamentary trust that receives a former main residence, do we have access to, sorry, do we, are we subject to land tax? Uh, do we have subject to a land tax threshold if we are? Or is there a foreign beneficiary surcharge? Because if we have a foreign trust, not only do we pay land tax if we're liable to land tax, but we also pay a surcharge on top. If we still decide uh, to transfer the main residence to the testamentary trust, if that's what our, our will says, our client's will says, and that's what we want to do, the outcome is going to depend on what state we're in. So I will cover off on most states, when I say most, the most common states that we operate in. So in New South Wales, a discretionary testamentary trust would not be entitled to a land tax threshold. However, pursuant to section 20 and clause 10 of schedule 1A of the Land Tax Management Act, if the testamentary trust is structured so that the beneficiary who uses it as a main residence is granted a life estate under the will, or that beneficiary is granted a life occupancy, right of occupancy under the will, uh, then we will have access to the main residence exemption for land tax in New South Wales. So we need to be careful about how we structure our testamentary trust. In Victoria, uh, again, we can achieve the main residence exemption for land tax if, if they are granted a right to reside for no consideration, the dwelling was the main residence of the deceased and the beneficiary does not have another main residence or the beneficiary is granted a life estate under the will. In Western Australia, the restrictions are tighter. Uh, Section 22 of the Land Tax Assessment Act states that it only applies to an executor or administrator with a further condition that a beneficiary has a life interest or a beneficiary has a right to occupy and they use it as their main residence. Uh, in Queensland, probably the most liberal uh, in that there's an exemption if a life tenant is using it as their main residence. So if we have testamentary trusts, sorry, if we have a, a main residence passing to a testamentary trust that is going to continue to be used, and the type of scenario here is a husband and wife type scenario where the, the home is passing to the testamentary trust, then in order to ensure that we don't pay land tax and we maintain our main residence exemption, then we're going to need, our we're going to, need to structure our testamentary trust in that way. Of course, there's other states and territories in Australia um, we don't tend to operate as much in those, so that's all we're covering in terms of the presentation. But if you have clients in those other states and territories, obviously you do need to review the provisions if you're looking at putting a main residence into a testamentary trust. Of course, we may not be dealing with other land. Uh, a testamentary trust may, may receive other lands such as commercial premises, farming land, residential property. So we, we'll need to think about the land tax effect uh, in that. New South Wales, we've got some issues there because a, a testamentary trust will not get a land tax threshold. It will in some other states. So depending on our client circumstances, one strategy that we may have to look at is having multiple testamentary trusts uh, with separate trustees and different parcels of land go to different 
testamentary trusts. Obviously, that's going to increase our complexity, but the trade-off may be worth it uh, in order to um, uh, minimise our land tax costs. As mentioned earlier, we also need to think about the foreign beneficiary surcharge for land tax. So in relation to that, um, for most states, uh, we now have legislation and we now have interpretations that if we have a uh, a beneficiary of a trust who is a non-resident, uh, regardless of whether they're discretionary or otherwise, then that trust will be deemed to be a foreign trust and be subject to the foreign surcharge on land tax. So as we're doing estate planning and our planning, if we're looking at uh, property going into a testamentary trust and it will be subject to land tax, we want to make sure that we're having the terms of our testamentary trust drafted uh, so that we don't have any foreign beneficiaries and we're not also uh, paying extra surcharge land tax. Uh, also need to consider stamp duty surcharge. Most, um, or in all states, if property is passing to a testamentary trust under the will, it will be stamp duty free. However, if our testamentary trust then goes out and acquires property, uh, there is a surcharge on stamp duty if it's a foreign trust. So again, we wanna make sure that uh, uh, we're not falling afoul of those provisions uh, if that if that testamentary trust is then acquiring more property in a particular state. One matter that is often overlooked uh, is foreign resident capital gains withholding. So you may remember we had the implementation of this regime a few years ago now where if we transfer land or shares in land rich companies, it requires us to hold 12 point withhold 12.5 percent of the market value if the transfer or so in in this case, it would be successively either the, uh, the deceased or the legal personal representative or the executor, where we have property going into the estate and then going out to a testamentary trust, if the transferor cannot produce a clearance certificate from the, tape, from the ATO. Um, so technically, this applies. Uh, and it does would require us, in the normal scheme of things, to get these to get clearance certificates in relation to the transfer of land going into a testamentary trust. However, the commissioner has subsequently released a legislative instrument that states that no withholding is required in these circumstances. Other CGT issues that we will need to consider uh, include access to the discount capital gain and then also returning to streaming. Because streaming doesn't just apply to frank dividends, it also applies to streaming of capital gains. So considering the first part in terms of the discount capital gain, what consider this scenario we hold an asset for four years unfortunately we pass away and the asset passes to the trust of the testamentary trust who sells it six months after they receive it will they still be, be able to access the cgt discount contained within division 115 of the income tax assessment act 1997 the answer to that question will depend on whether the asset was a pre-cgt asset or post-cgt asset so section 115130 115 modifies the ownership period for each asset for the purpose of the discount gain as follows. If it's a pre-CGT asset, the time period for ownership commences when the deceased dies. For a post-CGT asset, the time period for ownership commences when the deceased acquired the asset. So in our example, if it was a post-CGT asset, we've only held it for four years. We still, we, as in the testament trustee of the testamentary trust, would still be able to access the discount capital gain, even if they sold it within one month, two months, six months, in our example, of acquiring the asset. Um, in terms of the pre-CGT asset, obviously they don't get access to the discount capital gain. It would have a market value cost base attributed to it as at the date of death of the taxpayer. So there may not be any much in the way of capital growth if we're selling it six months later, uh, but worthwhile bearing in mind uh, if we have something that does have a large capital growth in that period, sometimes that occurs, for example, say with private company shares or ASX shares, sometimes they go up, not just down. Um, in terms of that, then we may be better off waiting until we get access to the discount capital gain, obviously. Again, returning to the streaming provisions that were brought in 2010, 2011, much like the issue with streaming frank dividends, the first thing that we will need in our testamentary trust is for the trustee to to have the power to stream. If we don't have that, we can't stream capital gains and we can't get access to things. Oh, sorry, and we can 
potentially lose access to things like the discount capital gain and other things like the small business concessions. If you think about it, where we could have further complications uh, when we're streaming discount gains or, or CGT concessions is that in order for our beneficiaries to be specifically entitled to the entire capital gain, they must be able to, you must be able to distribute the net income that represents the, C, the net gain to the beneficiary via the income provision. So this is what usually happens in practice. And then you normally make a capital distribution of the difference between the gross gain and the net gain. So the 50% reduction using the capital distribution powers. That way we can ensure that we're meeting the streaming requirements. But what if our client wants to have a testamentary trust that has a capital beneficiary and an income beneficiary, and they're not the same. Uh, so somebody can't receive both capital and income. In that circumstance, we would not have the capacity to stream capital gains. Uh, so we would lose access to the discount or other concessions in those circumstances. So something to bear in mind, discussions with client, if, they, if they're considering having separate classes of beneficiaries and particular beneficiaries who cannot receive both capital and income. Turning to the small business CGT concessions contained in Division 152 of the Income Tax Assessment Act 1997, they are, of course, very generous concessions. So a question that may be legitimately asked is whether, our, is whether if our client passes away unpredictably, would the executor or the beneficiaries still be able to access the small business concessions on the sale of the asset? So remembering, uh, this is only going to apply to assets that are owned by the deceased. So whether that's commercial property used in a business or whether that's interests in a business such as shares or units. So with that, um, it's worthwhile knowing that the concessions also extend to the legal personal representative and trustees of testamentary trusts pursuant to section 152.80 of the 1997 Act when we meet the following conditions. The relevant CGT assets must be a deceased estate asset or a joint asset. That's clear, otherwise it's not going to form part of the, the estate and the testamentary trust. And any of the following applies. The asset devolves to the LPR, the asset passes to the beneficiary, the asset owner's joint tenants reverts to the surviving joint tenant, and the asset passes to the trustee of the testamentary trust. So we have a, uh, the asset passing to somebody else. and the deceased would have been able to claim the small business concessions if the asset was disposed of immediately before their death. So important to remember that's our measuring time for things like maximum net asset value test or small business entity test, the turnover test, not when we actually sell it from the testamentary trust. Our measuring time is at the date of death of the deceased and the relevant asset is disposed of within two years of the deceased death. So we can still have access to those small business concessions uh, if we dispose of the assets principally within that two year period. Uh, so this may give us some planning opportunities as well as way, ways to deal with lumpy assets to even up distributions under the estate in a tax effective way. Um, there are some modifications to the general rules and there to the 15 year rule and the small business retirement exemption. Obviously we have somebody who has died so in respect to the 15 year rule, we don't need to meet the requirement that there is a retirement person's dead. And in respect to the small business retirement exemption, we don't need to contribute any amounts to superannuation uh, in order to meet those concessions. So again, that person has died, so uh, we can't do it usually. Lastly, covering off on uh, foreign beneficiary traps or what we call foreign beneficiary traps, you should be aware of CGT event K3 which occurs when an Australian tax resident makes a gift of post CGT assets that are not taxable Australian property. So that's generally interest in land or interest in companies that hold land or business assets to a foreign resident. So if we're making gifts to foreign beneficiaries or testamentary trusts where the trusts are deemed to be foreign trusts, then CGT event K3 will occur and needs to be considered. This could happen by accident, and I've seen it happen by accident uh, in terms of some will drafting that I've reviewed. For example, where we make a gift to a testamentary trust, where the trustee of that trust is a non-resident child, the way that uh, uh, the taxation residency rules operate in relation to trusts is one of the questions is, well, who is the, what is the residency of the trustee? If they are non-resident, then it would be a non-resident trust. So 
for that, uh, there could be two solutions if we're thinking of that scenario. One of them is bearing in mind other issues that we could have with this approach is that we can delay the administration of the estate as K3 is triggered under the legislation on the, on the gift, but is in effect dated on the death of the deceased. So if the estate has been administered for longer than the period that the commissioner has to amend assessments, so if we're administering an estate for more than four years, and then we trigger CGT event K3, uh, then the commissioner can actually not go back and amend that assessment and levy tax under CGT event K3. As I mentioned, there are other issues with this approach, and one of them would be uh, providing evidence to show why it's taking you more than four years to administer the estate, uh, and then also having a look at things like, um, uh, in terms of other beneficiaries making complaints about non-administration of the estate. The other, the, the simpler approach is to make sure that our trust is not a foreign trust. We could do that by appointing Australian resident trustees or co-trustees. Um, before I close off, just, uh, it's not on any of the slides, it only came through this week. Uh, just so uh, as a further planning point, um, tax and division 7A, I have seen a recent private ruling issued by the commissioner where they take the position that uh, if we have uh, somebody who's deceased and they owed money to a company, uh, up until the date that probate is granted, you could forgive that loan without there being a Division 7A issue or Division 7A deemed dividend. Um, I didn't actually agree with the reasoning provided within the private ruling, and I think uh, it may be interpreted differently by other taxation officers, uh, but maybe a planning point there. Uh, of course, again, somebody's got to die not many volunteers for that, but, um, but uh, something to bear in mind, it may be that uh, you, you also choose to get a private ruling to protect uh, that, um, uh, the taxpayer in that circumstance. So just to recap on what we've been through today, as I mentioned uh, a few times, testamentary trusts are usually used for asset protection purposes. They do offer some taxation advantages and we've been through those, uh, but like with most things, it's not a cookie cutter approach. We need to consider potential taxation disadvantages. We need to consider the assets that are passing to it and the different scenarios and issues that arise with that uh, in order for us to give proper estate planning advice to our clients. Uh, on that point, before I throw back to Paul, again, just mention uh, from now, we will no longer be having weekly webinars. They will be every fortnight and we're going to be running our seven part estate planning series. Uh, so that's uh, something that we developed for advisors uh, to give training to advisors so that they, you have a good, strong knowledge of estate planning issues. Uh, so look out for the invite for that, which will be coming out. And with that, I shall pass back to Paul for any questions. Thanks, Adrian. 